Hallo. Okay, guys, I want to start, and I would like you to start to. Hey, yo. Welcome to uh, this week's lecture in scientific programming in Python. This week is going to be about NumPy, and this week is going to be by me. Um, so Rüdiger uh, is not here today. Um, first of all, what you just told me, what I just noticed, um, that sometimes in the test script it says here matrix.matrix. .matrix. Um, this first matrix is only the place where, um, it's only the file of where our matrix class is. So you defined in this, uh, for this homework, you defined in the matrix.py file, um, you made a class called matrix, and when it's imported into the, oops, when it's imported into the test matrix file, it's imported as matrix, and thus when I need to, when I want to uh, run functions from that file, or, cla or use classes from that file, I have to write matrix.matrix. .matrix. So every time it's used here, it, it's used here in the test script, we look for matrix.matrix. .matrix. This is the file where it comes from, which we imported here, and this is the class. Um, so I just noticed that sometimes we say in the um, readme that matrix.matrix .matrix is used, and sometimes we say that only matrix is used. That's wrong. Um, it's either, so depending on what's, uh, what you can uh, understand better, it's only matrix or matrix.matrix. .matrix. Okay, so how far are you guys in the current homework? So who's done with the current homework? Okay, uh, that's certainly not everybody, um, but yeah, you have time. So, yeah, um, I have one, two things here in the, from the current homework, which I wanna talk about, which was one example. Someone sent to me where there were two errors, which are, uh, I think quite good errors to see what's, what can be wrong there. Okay, first of all here, um, we import this, this countdown. Um, so this works the same, right? In, we import from utils. So I think Rüdiger used it last week, but he didn't explain how it's imported because we import here from utils, right? Utils is a file utils.py. And there's a function countdown, thus we can import from, u, from utils, we can import countdown. And doing it like this, we don't need to write utils.countdown, but simply countdown because now countdown's in the namespace here. And why do we have to do this? Well, because we want, uh, if we, um, so our lecture.ipython notebook file is inside um, a subfolder of the directory where this utils.py file is. And Python, when it wants to import files, looks into all files in the this.path variable. And so far, our superfolder here wasn't in the this.path variable, and we could not import files from this directory. And to be able to import it, we need to append the directory of where our utils file lies, um, which is just one directory above in this case, um, to our this.path. Um, and this here is, of course, a relative um, path. To get what your current path is, um, we can look at the, oops, we can look at the absolute path of dot, which is the path of the current file. And if we print that, oops. Why is this unfeeling modus always there? So, and if we print this current path, so this is the path where my file here lies, which is this one, and thus one above that, there's the countdown, and to, to be able to, uh, there's the utils, and to be able to import the utils, um, we have to add that path to our file. Okay, um, then like I said, I have these two things, um, which I found from the last homework. Uh, first of all, sorry that I didn't, that I responded rather late to many emails, also concerning the homework before, I wasn't there. Um, it's not gonna happen again, I'm gonna be faster in answering emails from now on. Um, okay, so one task of the homework was to write this matrix.field method, um, where, which was supposed to create a new matrix um, with these parameters. And this was an example of a factory method. A factory method is in the namespace of our class, so it's a static method in the namespace of a class matrix, so we call matrix, the class name, dot something, and this then returns um, a, a new matrix. 
So this here is an example of how somebody wrote it. There are two errors here, one concerning the factory itself and one concerning another, and one is another error which doesn't have, error which doesn't have anything to do with that, um, but will also lead to wrong behavior. Um, so can you spot what the two errors here in this solution are? Um, yes, in fact, not even that. Um, so static methods don't know the object. So the class methods are called with a class. Static methods, in this case, this is a static method. They don't even know, so they, they wouldn't know what the self is. Because when I call, um, so when I have an object of a class, so, so imagine I have a class, um, Last cat, and there's something in there. And then um, I have kitty as a new cat. Then kitty is, so this, there's a class cat, and kitty is an instance of the class cat. And when I write kitty, kitty dot, I don't know, imagine there's a function meow. When I call kitty.meow, what Python automatically does, Python auto also all, all, uh, always gives you this syntactic sugar. When I call kitty.meow, what it actually does is it calls cat.meow with the first argument being kitty. So that's why the first argument in Python functions, like in, in um, instance function, is always the self. Because the self is simply filled by Python with the pointer to our cat kitty. So it's a normal static method basically called on an instance and then Python automatically makes this instance the very first argument. And then when I call on instances, when I call methods, Python automatically fills this self. However, this method is never supposed to be called from an instance but only from the matrix class, which can be seen by the capital M here. And thus, yeah, as you said, the self argument doesn't make any sense. And instead, what we have to do is um, we have to return um, a new matrix. So in factory methods, we call the constructor of, um, of the class itself. OK, what's the second error, which doesn't have to do with um, static methods or classes at all? Um, yes, but if we execute it, um, we'll see it looks right. So, so this looks right. Well, what happens now um, if I change one value? Oops. What would happen if I execute this? Change the value in every single row because we created this row here once. So we made this sample row and then we copied this very same row for as many rows as we have. As, as we have. 
So when we create a list, Python creates somewhere this list and then a name for that list. And when I reuse that list, I simply reuse the pointer. I create a new pointer to the very same list. And if I follow that pointer, I change the list in all places. And that's like these side effects I was talking about um, when you don't create new objects but reuse old objects. So instead, you should use um, a double nested list. So for i in range calls, for j in range rows, um, sample ij equals value. Why do you do you understand why this is the case? Why this side effect happens? Who does understand what this why this occurs? Okay, so many do not. So. Um, let's see, when we, write, when we write this very line, we create somewhere a list. So this here is the object space, and this here is the namespace. Um, when we write this line, we create somewhere a new list here, which we can fill afterwards, and we bind the name sample to it. The sample now points to this. And then um, to this, OK, let's make it empty at first because we're pending. And then, because lists are mutable, we can change the content of this very object. Um, and we can append new values. So we append the value 2, make a new list. We append the value 2, and we do that again. And then we have our sample here, which is now this list. Then we make a new list, result, which is also empty at first. So we create an object, and we create a name for that object, and bind the name to that object. And then for the number of rows we have, so three times, we result our sample um, to the result. So what afterwards stands here is sample, sample, sample. And when I now look at result, uh, oops result at position one, what I'm extracting is so this simply points to this very sample. And when I change that, so at the position zero equals five, I go to result. So I look up what, res what's res what result is. I go to the first index, which is this sample, which is the same as the other ones. I follow the name into the object space, and I change this value. However, now I changed all the values because this sample is reused all the time. So yeah, caveats in programming. OK. Good. Let's get to number. Yes. Excuse me? Yeah, you would need nested loops for that. Otherwise, it wouldn't work at all. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. That's the sample solution. I don't want to show it, but that's how you do it. You just have to have two nested loops here. Yes, and that's why it doesn't work. Ah, so this error is not reproducible if you have two group, if you have two um, two nested loops, because then you have a, a simple a simple number, and like an integer, and integers are not mutable, so you cannot change this object here. But you have to would have to make the integer point to the the name of the variable point to another object, and thus um, don't change the original one. No, that's not better. Then you get this error. Generally, it's of course better. It's like if it's possible to make two loops after one after another, it's of course faster, because well, if you have two loops. Um, from one to three, you have six iterations at all. If you nest them, you have three times three equals nine iterations. So it's 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 worse computation wise, but well this side effect you don't you certainly don't want to have, so this here is um, the worst thing. Okay. Um, NumPy. Good. So we had obviously we saw that we had lists, and lists are a really nice, flexible way. We have lists, we have dictionaries, we have a lot of stuff, uh, flexible ways to store and manipulate data. Um, however, this is really, really slow because of the way Python is. Because Python allows, like, we, like last week or two weeks ago, we put cheesecakes, we put integers, we put everything into our list. And because like Python allows that, which is great, 
But on the other hand, it makes Python really slow because every time we have an operation, so we saw how we overloaded operators, right? When we wrote two plus two, it was two dot underscore underscore add underscore underscore and then the other two. So when we use operators, Python always needs to check what type the variable is. And that makes Python really, really, really slow. Python is one of the slowest languages there is because of um, the way Python objects just can, just can contain everything. And Python doesn't check um, for types. For example, so imagine we had here our measurements and we want to calculate. So this here is just some random array, oops. Some random list of measurements. Right, okay, this is rather long to print, obviously. Um, and imagine from these uh, one million measurements we wanted to calculate the mean, so what we would do, or what other functions would simply do for us, but under the hood they do the same, they go through every single measurement, have an accumulator, sum them up, and in the end they divide by the length of the entire list. So this is how Python does it. But for every single operand, Python checks, well, are both still integers? Okay, then, and then it has to do all this stuff. So this takes rather long. So to do that, uh, so for one million numbers, calculating the mean is 25 milliseconds, which is considerable um, if you do that often. And in experiments or in uh, machine learning, though you do that kind of stuff, obviously, very, very often. And for that purpose, NumPy was invented because NumPy can simply say, well, in my array, I'm certain there are only, there are only integers. And you don't need to type check every single time. You just do the calculations. And also NumPy doesn't in C, and C is generally much faster. So what we want to use is NumPy. And to use NumPy, we first have to import it. Oh, what is this? I don't have NumPy. Um, so um, many Windows users, um, for many reasons, Windows users of you, it didn't work to import all the stuff in one um, batch. So I'm just going to demonstrate for a sec how we figure out um, how to um, import, how to um, install that module. And when you import a module um, and don't know the name of it, so normally you always, once you inside your terminal, you always pip install and then the name of that thing. So I'm here in my base environment, so of course I need to con activate my scientific program environment first. And then I simply pip install numpy. I said numpy. Okay, and then pip automatically installs it for me and everything's easy. Oh gosh, I hope this works. It would be pretty bad if it wouldn't work right now. Okay, however, um, this doesn't work for every package um, because sometimes the package name is another name as the pip name. For example, I think it's sklearn. So sklearn is named um, sklearn when you import it and scikit-learn when you install it, which sucks. But the easiest way to figure out um, what the name of the actual package is, you can simply Google PyPI, which is the Python package index, and then the name of the stuff you want to, um, you want to import, and then you should get to the PyPI website.org. Ah, okay, so it was the other way around. When I import it, I import scikit-learn, so scikit-learn, and I wouldn't know scikit-learn is no package in PyPI, but, ah, no, it was even another example. Never mind then. Um, so if I Google some package name, so the name I imported, and I figure out on PyPI what the name is, I can simply pip install and then whatever the name was from PyPI because PyPI is the place where pip looks for all the packages. So now I installed NumPy successfully and when I now import NumPy SMP, everything works. So some of you have to do this um, because you didn't have NumPy in your packages so far. Okay, and what does NumPy have? Well, NumPy has its standard data type ND array, which is n-dimensional array. So NumPy is made for this kinds of array. So we had our one million measurements here as a Python list, and okay, simply can, I can simply create um, the constructor of our NumPy array using a Python list, and it creates uh, and it converts uh, this list into a NumPy array. So this is now of, so while it looks just almost the same as the list, only saying this is an array. Um, our type is now numpy.n-dimensional array. And we can work with these number arrays. So they behave very similar to lists, so I can simply index them. So I can take the first element, I can the first five elements. So this works just like a list, um, but it's way faster under the hood, as we will see in a second. Um, also, NumPy uses its own um, types. So 
every element of a NumPy array is not a mer Python int, but a NumPy own um, data type, for example, int64, int which is just a NumPy, um, NumPy's representation of other of um, numbers. Okay, with 64-bit accuracy, and you can even increase the accuracy of that numbers. Okay, and if we now, NumPy offers a bunch of functions, for example, um, simply getting the mean of um, a set of numbers. This doesn't make sense for Python lists, because in Python lists there can be other things, and the mean is not defined for strings, for example, but a mean is certainly defined for numbers, ints and floats, which NumPy uses to work with. So NumPy provides us the method, um, the method mp.mean, and we see this np.mean takes 1.29 milliseconds instead of this 25 milliseconds. This is actually a lot slower than it was. This is only a 25-fold increase. So when I tried it at home, um, I had a 100 times increase. So like timing methods isn't always the ac most accurate thing, but we still see this is a lot faster than using Python, than using pure Python. And believe me, always use NumPy when it's possible. Like, um, also, uh, where I worked, when we had something with, with lists, it was always the bottleneck. Everything using lists is the bottleneck. Just use NumPy and NumPy's functions every time you can. It makes your code so much faster. Like, from three days one time to half an hour one time was that happened to uh, colleagues of mine, and that happens all the time. So. Use NumPy as often as you can. NumPy provides functions for everything. NumPy is so much faster. Use NumPy. Um, okay, as much for that. Good. So let's look into an array. So a NumPy array. Um, so like I said, we can when we create an array, we can tell what um, data type we want to use. So we say d type equals int. So that uses NumPy's biggest int, which is int64. So we have created a new array of the d type int. Um, if the, D -type, the data type we explicitly tell it um, NumPy it's supposed to use um, doesn't match the given values, it will cast. So in this case, our values are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, um, but we say where well, we want a Boolean array, then NumPy simply casts all these integers to a, boole to a Boolean. And as the definition for Booleans is that 0 is false and everything else is true, only a 0 is false. Okay, if no data type is given, NumPy will automatically find the one it wants to use, and which is the smallest common denominator. So all ints are floats, and there is a float, and where well, not all floats are ints, um, NumPy figures out that, that the smallest common denominator of these data types is float, and thus NumPy will use the float64 data type. Um, again, if you know so there's also numpy.int8, for example, which is only 8 bits, and 8 bits is a quarter of the 64 bits. And if you know, for example, that you're only working with image data, um, be sh be sh uh, make sure that you're using int8, because image data, if it's only three times um, a number between, two, uh, between 0 and 255, um, then 8 bits are enough, and if you store your images, if you have like a million images and you store them on your hard drive, you save three quarters of space if you use int 8s instead of int 64s. So that makes a few gigabytes data set, a few megabytes. Um, so be sure that you use the D type, like it really makes a huge difference. Be sure that you use the correct D type, um, data type. Like the biggest one you need, but the smallest one possible. One as big as you need, but the smallest one possible. Okay, yeah. Um, so once we set a data type, NumPy will automatically um, transform uh, new values to the data type. So we said before that our float, wait, ah, okay, no, wait. This is, ah, this is our int array. So we said before, one line above here, that our int array contains int, data type int. Now we add a float to that. NumPy will automatically um, convert that to an int. Okay, um, so we have these non-Python data types, and Python is the nicest language in the sense that norm normal integers um, you can't overflow because Python, the number of bits Python needs for an integer is just dynamic. So if you increase your number and eventually you need more bits, Python will just provide you that more bits, and Python integers will never overflow even after Google Plex to the power of Google Plex, I don't know. Um, however, NumPy will overflow, so if we made an array um, of type int8, and we add um, 
something to that which would overflow, well, what will be the result of a u and array now? So what will be at the first position of this array? the same number uh, or well, the, uh, well, the one below because um, uh, int 8 can only save 256 different numbers. We had 255, we overflow and thus this one becomes a zero because one in binary using eight bits plus 255 in binary using eight bits is zero in binary using eight bits. So think about problems like overflowing. And also, there are also sometimes problems when comparing them to standard Python types because they have different accuracies sometimes. So the type of this here is numpy dot int something, in 64 it was, and the type of a normal numpy int, uh, Python integer is int, so the type here is different, is different, and that then can lead to rounding errors because if we use, for example, if we calculate 1.2 minus 1.0 in Python, that is, aha, who knew that? 0.199999 something, because um, the right, doing exponents is always not precise in computers, right? So, like this exponent mentissa way of writing it, so you can't represent all numbers using binary representation. And in NumPy, this is um, another value because NumPy simply uh, rounds smarter than Python. So even though NumPy uses um, less precision, NumPy rounds smarter than Python t itself, but because of that, um, it's a different result. And I had this error once, and I was not, as not, not this precise one, didn't find the precise one, but I looked into it so long before I figured out that simply NumPy sometimes does some th things with a uh, different precision than Python. So be aware of that. And if you compare these numbers, um, the smartest way to do that um, would be to simply check um, if they are in a certain range of each other. So we define epsilon, there's also in Python not math, in Python's math package there's also an epsilon, but let's say it's 0 0.001, and we simply check if the absolute value of the one minus the other is smaller than epsilon. And this now, what? Okay, who can tell me where I'm wrong here? Why is that two? Ah, oh, because order. And if I now check that, that's two, and those values are close enough. Okay, um, shape and number of dimensions. So, um, NumPy errors can have more than one dimension, and they can have truly more than one dimension in Python. So if I have a two-dimensional list in Python, this is what I have. I have the first list, and this list, oh, so this is what I have. I have the first list, and this are simply pointers to sublists. So there's no true two-dimensional list in Python. It's simply a list of lists. And in NumPy, I can have two two-dimensional lists, which um, we can also index better, for example, which we'll see later on. So imagine we made our NumPy array here, and this here is a one-dimensional array, so it's of shape. So we see it has um, five in the, in the first dimension, and well, obviously zero in every other dimension, so it's of shape five nothing. Um, and the number of dimensions where this is a one-dimensional array is one. Um, we can create um, so this is the way we create in Python, we create a two-dimensional list, right? But this here again, doing it like this, is again this error, because we reuse the very same list again and again. If we change it in one place, we change it in all places. Um, however, this error won't occur anymore if we convert it to a NumPy array. And in NumPy, it's truly two-dimensional, um, with a shape of, well, three, in this dimension and five in this dimension, and the number of dimensions here is two. So NumPy doesn't have this error anymore, and NumPy can simply write, um, 
to gym So if I do this on NumPy, I only change this one value. So NumPy is in that regard also nicer. OK, I can also make a three-dimensional array. So I simply make a three-dimensional list, and I create that to a NumPy array, and I have a three-dimensional array. So NumPy doesn't care. I think the highest number is something. Oh, I forgot it. It's something with five digits. So NumPy, have, NumPy can have um, any number of dimensions. OK. Um, there's a nice thing in NumPy I can uh, immediately transpose. There's just this property um, to transpose an array. So imagine this is our two-dim array, and we can transpose it, and this simply swaps um, the first two dimensions. And there are many other attributes. So in Python, there's a nice way if you want to figure out um, the attributes which um, um, an object has, you can um, use the deal function, which is which uses the underlying magic method underscore underscore dear underscore underscore of every object, which simply prints all the properties this object has. And we figure out that here we can transpose, which is which does the very same thing as T. We can convert a NumPy array to a list. We can convert it to a string, and so on and so on. And this is only um, a list of the stuff. Um, if I press Shift and Tab, um, it tells me more information of, about this array, so it tells me it's of type ND array, the string representation is this, it tells me even more of the doc string of NumPy's array, and it tells me one, uh, a few where these are the attributes which I can use. So T is the transpose, the data type, I can figure out the, the real and imaginary part, and so on and so on. These are by far not all, but this is just what Python gives and um, what NumPy arrays give in their documentation. OK, so creating arrays. Um, so, any questions so far, by the way? No. No. So creating arrays. Um, so far, we only created arrays using um, a list at first. But this is not really faster, because we first have to create a list, and then we make a number array from that. And we create the list in the slow Pythonic way. And we want to have a number array real quick. And NumPy, for example, for that, for that why don't you tell me if you put this down? Um, for that, NumPy has the equivalent of the range function in Python, which is numpy.a range. And by way, by the range function is, doesn't produce a list, but a range object, numpy.a range produces a numpy array immediately, which is great. So um, the arguments are the same as in the original range function. I can start by 2 until 14 with step 2, for example. So this is exactly the same as the numpy range arguments. Um, NumPy has another function, linspace, which creates um, a certain number of values in a certain interval, so evenly spaced. So between five and uh, between negative five and five, I want ten values. So obviously, um, the bounds are negative five and five, and then NumPy looks that it spaces the other ones evenly in between. Um, yeah, it's default D types float. I can use the um, functions np dot zeros. Um, which simply produces a number of zero, um, like an array of zeros. Um, this here is the shape argument. This is either a number, then it's one dimensional, or I can have like um, an arbitrary shape. So this makes a three dimensional array of zeros. Right? So I have two dimensions in the first, one, two, three in the second, and two in the third dimension. Okay. Um, can have the same for ones. Um, ah, damn. And then there's empty. Empty is the fastest way to create a NumPy array. So the issue in NumPy is that, for example, concatenating arrays is also not the fastest way to do stuff. NumPy is all about being as fast as possible and as efficient as possible. And if you, for example, dynamically, so when, Python, when you create a Python list, the, py the length of the Python list changes dynamically. This is what I showed you here. At first it was empty, then we had one, two, three elements. And this is like changing stuff dynamically. It's just the worst thing that can happen to a computer because it will have to reallocate a new memory at a different position because like the, the RAM is just a bunch of bits, right? And when you write the empty array here, um, some other programs will write stuff right after this empty array. And if you want to create, if you want to fill this array, if you want to increase the size, well, it doesn't fit because there's other important stuff in the RAM, so it needs to reallocate um, RAM and put your empty array somewhere else and update the memory address. It needs to do that every single time, well, in the worst case, 
you append something to that array, and that will be really, really slow on your computer. And thus, the, smart, the, the smartest way to create arrays is to create an empty array of the size you want to have it at first and then fill it. Because then you can simply, the NumPy knows, aha, I have, I don't know, 64 numbers of um, 8 bits each. So I allocate 64 times 8 bit, bits um, for this array on the computer's RAM. And when you fill the values, you don't need to reallocate RAM and copy the values so far because you can simply fill the values like the RAM has enough space. And the fastest way to do that is np.empty. np.empty simply says, I want to allocate something, some amount of RAM. Don't do anything with it. Just give me that um, former array. Um, empty, if you create something with empty, this leads to side effects. Because as we see here, now there are all ones in there. But if I call the zeros before that, there are all zeros in there. And if I did some other function, I don't know if this now works. Um, it just has some, OK, in this case it didn't. Empty just says this is your space of RAM. It doesn't fill it with zeros or something. So if you create an np.empty, if you do it on your own laptops and didn't execute stuff so far, it will tell that there are numbers in the range of negative billions up to positive billions, because it simply interprets the, um, the bits which, are, which has happened to be there on the RAM as numbers. And you need to fill it explicitly, otherwise you have obviously side effects. But this here is the fastest way. Okay, we can also make, and there's also the function np.full, which, which well, it can also give um, a shape and a fill value, which is basically the same as um, using np.once times this fill value. Okay, so an exercise, create a three by three array that solely consists of two. That should be rather quick, I hope. Well, the um, important thing is that we want to create an array of D type 2. And simply, then we create ones. Ones are interpreted as two in, uh, for NumPy and for Python in general. So we create an array of, oops, of np.ones, shape 3 by 3, data type 2, and uh, data type pool. And this is now all twos. OK, lastly, to create NumPy arrays, there's np.random which simply creates, well, random numbers of a shape, np.random.random. It's in the random module of, one, of NumPy, and the function is called, the method is called random. And I can also create, uh, use random.randint, random integer, which is, so this is the start, so numbers are in between zero and something, this is the stop. Numbers are in between zero and 10, 10 exclusive, so between zero and nine, 
and this is the shape, five by five. Okay, so using this np.random.rand and the Boolean d-type, we can create um, random Boolean arrays. So, it's too slow for me. Um, so, if we wanted to create a five by five array that contains roughly one a quarter of the items being false, so we don't want a precisely uh, one quarter of the items being false, we want statistically a quarter of the items being false. So, how do we create an array in which statistically um, one quarter of the items are false, or others being true. No, it doesn't. It creates integers. That's one random integers, but you can coerce it to Boolean simply specifying I want the D type Boolean. Okay, but uh, it can be normal because it's specifically specified as an integer. Wait, is it 46 for me too? I don't know which. Th th these are not the line numbers, so ah, I can't. Yes, sure. When you create it, you simply write D type. Ah, oh, you're still waiting. Mm. Same as here. Oh yeah, there's always this D type equals something. It's the most. Ah, okay. Um, in this case, it doesn't work because it occurred. So. In this case, it doesn't work because you have to curse it otherwise, but then you can simply go for s type will, which is one of the um, methods listed here, and um, you can coerce it like this. Because one end doesn't want Boolean because one end complains. So, this is also the solution for the exercise here. I think this was, oh yeah, that was my hint here. Aha. Uh -huh. um, you can use the method s type bool to convert an integer array to a Boolean array. And then the solution is simply this. Um, so we create random integers between zero and four. That means a quarter of these integers are now zero and of shape five by five because this is what we wanted. And then we coerce that to Boolean and because a quarter of these integers statistically are false, a quarter of the um, resulting Booleans are, for, uh, are zero, a quarter of the Booleans are false. Yes. Ah, sure. Right. Yes, you're of course right. Oh. <laughs> Thinking. Yeah. Um, right. Good. Um, the next thing, so, but this, like I said, only on average, if we counted this, I wouldn't know if it's true right now. So if we wanted to have precisely one quarter of the elements true, what we would have to do is we simply create, um, an so we create, um, these are five by fives are, are 25, so that's not even divisible by four. 
So if we had 24 ones, we'd simply create six truths, six falses, I mean, and 18 truths, and then shuffle the array, and then we create something where precisely six elements are false. We'll get to that later on, um, or rather on Thursday. Okay, then there's np.repeat, so we can simply repeat this number three five times. The first argument for np.repeat is an array-like, so we can create this sequence. However, repeat repeats it in its way, meaning I repeat this two times, this two times, this two times, and then this two times. So there's a caveat here. We'll get to that in a second, how to resolve that. Yes, then there's reshape. So imagine we created um, an, a range from 2 until 13. So this is of shape 12 nothing. We can reshape that. So we can make this a two-dimensional array of shape 3 by 4. Um, so we, the, the reshape method expects as arguments the number of, uh, so the, the sizes of the dimensions. If we have as one argument a negative 1, that means specify, like, uh, figure it out automatically. Because the shape is 12, we want one dimension to be 4, where then the other dimension needs to be 12 divided by 4, which is 3, number can figure it out by itself. Um, ah, in this case, we wanted to have by 2. So 12 divided by 2 is 6, so this is the same as a.v shape 6, 2. OK. So this here is a longer exercise. So what we've seen so far using only NumPy and what we've seen so far how do we make a two-dimensional array that contains the sequence one, two, three in every row? So for 10 rows, right? Ah, uh -huh. 10 rows. So we want something like one, two, three, one, two, three. This is the result we want to have. This is what I really love about NumPy, when um, by using, uh, by, by smart reshaping and smart um, masking, which we'll see later on and so on, you can create any number, any sequence of numbers in a really fast and efficient way by smartly reshaping what you, what you have so far and then tracking a slice of that and then reshaping that slice again which is in any case more the most efficient way to create any sequence of numbers. So yeah, let me reveal the first interval. So this is what we're supposed to create, right? So this is how we would, ah, I can't reveal it because I can only reveal stuff after the time has gone. Um, but yeah, this is what we want to create. We want um, this one, two, three times 10, like this, um, and then reshaped um, like this. So this is how we would do it in pure Python. However, NumPy doesn't have this times 10 in the way Python does. And this leads to the side effects, um, as we mentioned before, if we do that in Python. So it doesn't anymore if we coerce that to NumPy, but we wanted to use pure NumPy because this is a shit syntax and shouldn't exist. Should exist, but should at least know what you're doing.
let me erase the second hint. Um, so the transpose at least helped me in the way I created it. I bet there are a billion ways of creating that. This is, I use the transpose eventually. So reshaping, transposing, and creating a sequence. So this is what it's supposed to be like. And this is how I personally created it. So this is using pure NumPy. This is a sequence of zero and uh, of one until three, which we repeat 10 times. If we only do it like this, however, we see that we have a stupid order and that we have first the ones, then the twos, and then the threes. Um, but what we can do is, well, let's first reshape that into a shape we want to have, like not the precise shape we want to have, but now we have it at least so we have the ones, then the twos, and then the threes, and then we take the transpose, we take the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if we now take the transpose of this, so yeah, this is the result we had below, 10 rows with one, two, three each. So using a smart combination of, of reshapes and transposes and other stuff, like I said, you can create any sequence of numbers in any dimension you want in NumPy, which is really nice and the faster and efficient way. Always. Okay. Um, comparing arrays. So um, imagine we had, we had this situation. So we create two completely empty arrays. So both are zeros. And then we define this is our measurement of preciseness we want to have. So our epsilon is this. And then we add this 0.5 times epsilon, so less than our measuring accuracy to the one array, and we say, we ask if A equals B. Um, well, first of all, NumPy tells me not if the arrays are itself the same, but for every single element it compares them. This is like um, something in NumPy. If we compare lists in Python, it compares the entire list um, and gives one, true or false. If you compare NumPy arrays, it compares every single element, returning a new array of the same shape of type Boolean. Well, in second of all, it says this here are not the same, even though this is, they differ by less than what we wanted them to differ. Um, well, first of all, to get about the first thing, we can use a equals b dot all, because dot all is simply a NumPy method, which asks if all elements of the returning array are true which is not the case because this one here is false, right? So it's not the case that all items from A and B are the same. Um, however, there are flaws with doing this. Um, for example, if either A or, A or B is empty and the other contains a single element, it will also return true, which is definitely not what we want. Um, and if A and B don't have the same shape, um, it will throw an error because it can't compare them because it doesn't know what the shape of the resulting error will be. So there's a smarter way of comparing two arrays A and B, and this is simply NumPy's array equal um, function. So this here then returns also false because where well, they were false. However, what I said before, they differ only by less than our measuring accuracy. Um, for that, there's also the, fun the uh, NumPy method np.all close, which looks at that where you can uh, specify an epsilon. Um, I think it's even epsilon equals. And no, it wasn't epsilon. Okay, I don't know what, uh, what the parameter is. You can look it up. Um, but yeah, which compares them uh, if they are close. And they are close enough for our measurements, so that's fine. Furthermore, there's also this numpy.is close, which is again element wise. Um, but considers um, epsilon differences. So almost equal ones are equal. Okay, um, next topic is masking. Masking is one of the nicest things um, in NumPy. 
So imagine we have our uh, NumPy range from one until five, and we create a Boolean mask, which is simply well, a numpy.bool array. And using this mask for indexing, so we can index now our array at that mask, and it returns only these elements where this mask is true. So we wanted to have every other element, so the first, the third, and the fifth, and this this returns only the one, three, and five. And what's even cooler is that we can also assign stuff. So we can say the array at these positions, at these indexes, why we can do that, this is uh, also fancy indexing, which we'll get to uh, Thursday, is um, another reason, but we can also assign stuff using this mask. So what I can even do is I can ask, so for array, and I have a mask of, well, where the numbers of the array are bigger than zero. Wait, what is this? Ah, this is, is that error? Ah, okay, I assigned 10 to these, uh -huh, of course. So our error is now um, 10 to, well, so all are bigger than zero. So let's get only the ones where, which are smaller than 10. So and this only returns these two. So I, this mask here is created on the spot because this array smaller than 10 is an element-wise comparison. So it looks for every single element here in our array if the element is smaller than 10 and returns a Boolean, um, a Boolean array. So this one is small, it's not smaller than 10, this one is smaller than 10, this one is not, this one is, this one is not. And this here then is a Boolean array which we can use for masking. So I can ask for array at the position where array is smaller than 10. So give me, oops, give me array at the position where array is smaller than 10, and then these are these two entries where these are false. Okay, so this leads us to another exercise. We place all odd numbers in this given array with negative one. You know the operator to find odd numbers, right?
Okay, so who's got something and wants to say it? Um, okay, I will continue anyway. Um, so, um, odd numbers are the ones where the um, s klassen division modulo. modulo, where the modulo operator um, is um, zero, uh, uh, even numbers are zero, for odd numbers it's one. So we look for the positions where the element modulo two equals one, and we assign negative one to these. And doing this, we assign negative one to all odd numbers in this array. Okay, um, we'll get to um, masking and more indexing on Thursday, but as much for that now, it's just a really nice way of doing stuff with NumPy, which is not provided with Python lists, of course. Okay, um, then let's get to mathematical operations. So. NumPy contains a lot of mathematical functions, all the functions you need, and they operate in a vectorized manner. Vectorized manner simply means they are much, much faster because they work on every single element simultaneously, and you don't have to loop over the array or list and perform this operation every single element. So they, they are applied to each element without explicit for loops, and this makes NumPy, and this is written in efficiency, and it's parallelized, and it's done by really smart people, and it's always more efficient than everything you want to do. These functions are called ufunctions, universal functions in NumPy, and you use them really all the time where you can. So standard arithmetic works, so the operators work in a different way than they do with normal lists. So we had a, if this was a Python list and we had times three, what Python would do is it would create um, wait, something like this, right? The same list repeated three times in a row. Um, for NumPy, the times operator is, simply means for every element, calculate the number this element times whatever is afterwards. Um, this also works, so this works for numbers. So an array times a scalar. Um, the operators also work for arrays of the same shape or broadcastable shape. What broadcastable shapes are, we'll get to in a second. So I can simply add the array to itself. And this adds zero plus zero, one plus one, two plus two, uh, three times three, and so on. And if I had, um, so I, what I could also do is, for example, I could calculate array plus array times two, for example, and this would be, right? So first of all, create a new array, array times two, which would be O, two, four, and so on, and then we could add that. And yeah, other functions work just as much. The array minus itself is zeros everywhere, of course. Then NumPy can also divide, and in contrast to normal Python, so in normal Python, if I divide it by zero, um, Python would raise me an error. NumPy only raises a warning. So, so in standard Python, one divided by zero gives me an error and my program would crash and stop and the world would explode. Uh, in NumPy, it only gives me a warning. It's invalid value encountered. It doesn't even tell you precisely what it is. And then it makes this, this thing not a number. Not a number, N-A-N, is a NumPy type. Um, you can compare not a number with anything. Not a number will return false when compared to everything, even compared to not a number itself. So NAN is not equal to NAN. It's, I think, the only thing where this holds. But it makes sense because NumPy will, like this will always be, um, and NAN will always be transferred. So the error will always um, uh, stay. If I add something to that, it will stay in an end. If I compare it with something else, it will stay in an end. So it always gets, so you know when there's an NAN. However, you have to explicitly look for that, obviously, because NumPy only gives you a warning and doesn't crash. Yes, um, multiplication works the way we expect it to be. Um, this is the to the power of operator. Don't um, confuse it with the caret. I think there is the caret, which is a bitwise or. Yeah, I think it's a bitwise, it's a bitwise XOR or something. So the carrot operator exists, but has a completely different meaning. So this is to the power of. Okay, um, so your new exercise, create a one dimension array that repeats the sequence one, two, three, 30 times. Um, this is very similar to the one we had before. And you can, of course, reuse your old solution. Um, but you can also do it like this.
Oh shit, there's a solution already. Oops. Did you look at that? No. Okay, so this exercise had the purpose of, um, again, showing you that there are countless ways of doing stuff in NumPy. And what I, for example, here did was simply I had, um, I wanted 30 times 1, 2, 3, so I needed a range from uh, 0 until whatever 30 times 1, 2, 3 is, um, and then uh, modulo 3 to get through a list of one, uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and then I can simply add 1 to all of these, and this will create 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And what I could also do is simply flatten, using the number method flatten, um, the one we created before. And I could also use the Python way and create a list, this here, side effect free, because I created a new um, list here. And that makes then the same, it's the same result as this one, and flatten that. However, like I said, NumPy is all about efficiency. So these are just lambda functions so that I can uh, time them. Like I said, NumPy is all about efficiency. And while there's not much difference between these two ways, so to use the first or the second, it doesn't change much. Sometimes this one is faster, sometimes this, but it's really not much difference. But the Pythonic, like the non-NumPy way, is a lot slower. I mean, not that much slower, but it is definitely slower because we have an explicit for loop here. So NumPy is always faster. Always a good idea to use NumPy. <clears throat> okay, next up, yeah, NumPy even has an operator for matrix multiplication. So the matrix multiplication in the case of 1D arrays is simply the inner product between the two vectors. So this is the same as np.sum and then we calculate the um, two vectors. This makes total sense. Um, however, we could also do array matrix multiplication. Whoops. I know this doesn't make sense. I need to add a new dimension. I will do that later on. So this here is multi multiplication. There's even a certain um, operator for that. Since Python 3. Point something, this is possible. Not with Python 2. Point something. OK, um, then there are other universal functions, like taking the logarithm. And then again, the logarithm for what was my error at the first index? Was it 0? Yeah, the logarithm. Um, the logarithm for 0 is undefined, or it's negative infinity. And no, wait, the logarithm for 1 is, oh, that's 0. And then for, for 0, it's somewhere, something like infinity undefined. So this, again, tells you an error, and it will result with, lead to the result of negative infinity. So this, again, there's a warning, not an error, I mean. And this can lead to side effects, and you have to pay attention. Yeah, then there's e to the power of. e to the power of, of 1 is obviously e. And the other ones, I don't care. 
take the sine, you can take the cosine, everything. I always try to use these vector weights u funks instead of acting as the loops. Yes. Um, yes, um, I did mention that before. Like, yeah, it's once you have so once you create once you created something like so if you created it like simply like this, yeah. it works. And so this Python list here has this side effect, and I did mention that earlier, but I wrote it somewhere. I think I didn't write it explicitly. Um, if, as, as soon as you convert it to a Python array, it works, and you it works if you change only one value. I, I showed that somewhere uh, earlier, sometime earlier. Um, I just did the other thing because this is certainly side effect free. So what's just the case? So imagine you had this here, and then somebody else would look at would um, reuse your code and would think, ma, I don't want this. I want, and then he makes. Um, he makes a new variable for that, and then he simply uses the variable here and does changes the variable here before. So for reusability, it's a smarter way to not have this side effect yeah. code in there. And if I did it like this times 30, it was just as fast as the NumPy functions, and I wanted to tell the, the time difference in using NumPy. That's why I wanted to incorporate a for loop here. So yeah, it's, as soon as it's converted to NumPy, it's side effect free, yes. Okay, um, broadcasting. So I told you stuff only works when the lists, are, uh, the arrays are of the same shape or broadcastable. Um, so if you try to add arrays of different shapes, NumPy will try to broadcast, which means expanding the arrays according to these three rules, um, which is best explained with this illustration. So if we had an array of shape where this is an array of shape three nothing, and this is an array of well, no shape because it's a scalar. Um, NumPy would try to increase the dimension of this one here first to make it an array of shape one nothing. And then in the second step, it would um, simply increase the, so if this here now has a dimension of one, and it can then increase the um, or the one dimensions to this one here. So. Uh, Okay, let's not explain that with that image, but like this. So, if two arrays have different numbers of dimension, the smaller shape is padded um, with... Okay, let's do it like this. Okay, so imagine we had a NumPy array, which would be like five, 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 and we added three. So the first thing NumPy does it's figuring out the dimensions of this. The dimension of this is three nothing, and the dimension of this, well, it doesn't exist. But what NumPy can do is it can increase the dimension here, making this a shape of one nothing. So this is the first rule. So if I have different number of dimensions, this has a dimension of zero, this has a dimension of three, uh, the number of dimensions, um, you can increase the number here. So this is the first step. And then in the second step, because this here, the value of this dimension here is one, there's only one number, it can simply take this, uh, take the number here and copy it that many times. So we make three, three here. And then the arrays have the correct dimension, a number can add them, leading to an array of eight, eight, eight. This is broadcasting. So let's get through this again. So we had this one, two, three plus five, Five is a scalar, we increase the dimension. Now it's three by nothing and one by nothing. And then we can simply increase, and repeat this value here. And then um, we broadcast it successfully and it worked. Um, same holds for if the dimensions, so here the dimensions, in the second example, the dimensions were three by three and um, three by uh, nothing at first, because it was only a row vector. First we increase the dimensions to make this three by one. And then we have, so what we have then, so if we had, what did we have here? We have this. That's just incorrect, wasn't it? 
So we have one, 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 and we had zero, one, two here. So we figure out the shape of these ones. So the shape of this is three by three. The shape of this is three by nothing. So what it does at first, this is in two square brackets, right? So this is basic. Okay, let me write that orderly. So, so this is three by three. This is three by nothing. What we do at first is we add a dimension of nothing there. So this is now shape three by one. And then it sees, aha, this here is a one, this here is a three. So I can just copy the same value again. Right, and then I can add this. And the result would be, so the result then would be, um, 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 so one plus zero is one, one plus one is two, one plus two is three, and and the same again and again, which is the result we have here. This even works if this here is a row and this, here is, this is a column and this is a row vector because it, this here is a three by one and this here is a one by three and it can increase the number, so the by one, it can, it can simply copy because this is a by three, it can simply copy this three times and for this, this is a one by something, so and this is a three by something, so it can copy this one three times and it broadcasts it both. So these are the rules. So if the arrays have different numbers of dimensions, the smaller shape is padded with the ones on its left side. The number of dimension matches, but the size of a dimension was not. Dimensions with the size of one are expanded. Okay, so five by three times three will lead to five by three uh, plus three, really to five by three plus one by three. This one is new. And then we can increase this because now we have this one by three. We can copy that. We can simply uh, copy that five times. And then there's a third, a third rule. If the shapes still don't match after we did this as often as we could for all dimensions as we could, then we uh, return a broadcasting error. So we can um, add arrays of the, same sh of the same shape. We can add um, row and column vectors to um, full matrices of the same shape or of shape one. We can add scalars to everything, which is what we already did before. Um, but we could not, for example, um, broadcast like, so if we had, I don't know, if we had an array of one, one, Make it again, one, one, and we wanted to add, um, let's say, so this is two and four. You could imagine this also works because it can simply copy this one here again two times somehow, but this doesn't work because this is not, so the shape here is two by two, and the shape of this here is four by two, two by four. And our two rules are where the number of dimensions is the same. None of these dimensions has the value one. So we can't do anything. Still doesn't match. Error. All right, did that make sense? Yes, I hope it did. So yeah, if you still didn't understand, um, the NumPy documentation gives you further insights. So imagine we have um, our five by five, no wait, this is five by, th five by three array. Um, we can add um, a normal row vector to that and broadcasting fails if we try to add a row vector of size four because this is, this is shape three by five, uh, five by three I mean, this would be shape four by one, uh, four by nothing and then four by one and four and five are not combinable. So this would be a broadcast error. All right, five minutes. Yeah, this is the last thing I want to talk about today anyway, so this is rather nice, I think. Um, aggregation functions, so so far we had, so we could 
so now we can add arrays to arrays and we can add arrays to scalars. Um, these are like the normal functions which return something in the shape of the array we put in, so or a combination of the shapes we put in in the case of these here, for example. Um, there are also aggregation functions. Aggregation functions simply reduce the dimensionality of an array, so return something of a lesser dimension, taking the max of or the min of an array, reduces the dimensionality. We had a whole array's input, we get one one value's output, it reduces the uh, dimensionality. It's an aggregate function. Okay, aggregation function provide an access argument to specify which dimension to reduce. And when Rüdiger explained this last year, um, he had quite some difficulty to explain that. So I made it a bit more, I just wrote everything in here so that I don't talk and I can just show. And I hope this works now. So imagine, um, so this random seed, I will talk about that on Thursday for a second. It simply makes, so if you set a random seed, which is not zero, it simply makes sure that every time you call a random function from now on, it will use the very same numbers, right? So this is supposed to be random. I use a one here. Um, this is not, in fact, random. And if I use the zero here, it would be different numbers all the time. Oh, it isn't. Never mind. I will explain that on Thursday anyway. Weird. OK. Um, so yeah, the random seed makes um, the random numbers the same, such that I can always reuse this very example. OK, so if we just pass the array to np.mean, it simply aggregates the whole array. So it takes the minimum of the entire array, which obviously is zero, and returns it. Um, however, there's this exit arg access argument, which allows us to specify which dimension should be aggregate aggregated. So it's an operation being applied to all entries that are obtained by keeping the indices in all dimensions fixed, except for the access dimension. OK, so if we take the minimum with access equals zero, we get four values which is 0, 11, 1, and 8. 0 is, so we're looking at columns here. X is equal to 0 is columns in a two-dimensional array. So we're looking at the 0, um, looking at this, the minimum is 11. We're looking at this, the minimum is 1. And we're looking at this, the minimum is 8. So X equals equal 0 in a two-dimensional array is columns. But I think we could even write X equals columns. Um, but this only, ah, we couldn't in this case. We can only do that in pandas. It's confusing anyway, so don't do that anyway. Um, yes, the axis concept extends to more than one dimension even. So if we had um, a three-dimensional array of size four by four by four, and we had axis equals zero, what we're looking at now is, so the, the, the minimum now is the minimum. So it will, be, it will keep this shape because what we're reducing is the, the, the zeroth axis, which is the one making these four things. So we only have one of these. So this is the shape or minimum will return. And then we're looking at this compared with this, compared with this, compared with this at the first position. So the minimum of these four here is five. This, 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 and this, minimum is eight. This, 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 and this, minimum is 11, and so on, and so on. So this works with more dimensions. And yeah, so the entry at index zero, zero, Five is the minimum of these values here, which are the top left of all these ones. OK, we don't only have axis equals 0. We have axis equals all kinds of values. And let me show that with another example. So imagine we had this, um, we had this 3 by 2 by 2 array. And well, first of all, finding the minimum of this entire array is obviously 0, because we're looking at all these values. There's 0, minimum is 0. If we looked at exits equals 1, what we would do, first of all, we would look at these four. That's a 2. These four, uh, x equals 0, I'm sorry. These four, that's a 1, and so on and so on, which is the same as looping over the other. Um, so we have a three-dimensional array, so we can access um, values of it using three dimensions. And if we want to have the minimum with axis equals 0, we loop over the other axis and simply return. So if we, if the same is going through all other axes of the respective error in turn, returning the respective aggregate for every combination of these. So we want to come for every combination of the other axes, we want to return the minimum. So if we loop over. Um, shape one and shape two. So if we loop over this, uh, the second and the third dimension, 
This is, these are the areas we get, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4 1, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 9, 8, 0. And we take the minimum of all those, so 2, 1, 6, 0, 2, 1, 6, 0. So this is the same, the same as doing this. For x is equals 1, we loop through axes 0 and 2. So if we take the np.mean for x is equals 1, let's look at a again. Um, what we do here is we take the minimum, respectively, of these combinations. So we have, huh, we have here the 2 and the 6. We have the 4 and the 9, 3 and 7, and so on, and take the minimum of these. So this is the minimum, this is the minimum, this, this, and so on. So what we do here, we loop over all axes besides 1. We take all elements, so this colon means all elements from here. So this is basically a range from negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, and we return, so we loop through the other axes, turn all elements from this axis, and take the minimum of those. And then finally, we have a three-dimensional array, so we can take the minimum in three dimensions and three axes. If we look for axis, axis equals two, we loop through axis zero and one, like we do here. Zero and one we loop through. We take all of the third index two, and then the results are thus the minimum of two and six, uh, of two and four, which is two, and so on and so on. So if we looked at A again, um, this is actually the most obvious one. Um, so this is the minimum of these two, of these two, of these two, these two, these two, and these two. Okay, um, what shape is it, however? It's obviously not in this, um, in a list shape, but the shape is obvious. Um, it's, well, the shape of the original array leaving out the specified axis. So um, if we take the minimum for axis equals two, we have a new shape of the other two dimensions, leaving the one here out. And this holds for every, this just compares, so this just compares it with the, to be certain that it's true. So whenever we take the minimum, we leave that axis out. This is just so much more complicated to explain than it actually is. So just try it out, you will see it. Um, however, of course, doing it um, with, the, um, with the min function from NumPy is, of course, much faster than using um, explicit loops to loop over them. Even explicit loops are rather fast because it's still NumPy, but using the minimum is much faster. Yes, that was actually as far as I wanted to get for today. So yeah, I'm done. I will see you on Thursday. I will talk for like half an hour on Thursday. And then we do the exercise, not even half an hour, less than half an hour, and then we do the exercises. If you have questions to the current exercise, come talk to me right now. Okay. That's it.